One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Who? Who is going to be here?
Hi, how you doing? No, no, never. Uh, actually, I have a 10 o'clock meeting, so it's probably just as well. Guess what happened here? It snowed. <laughs> okay, well, we had good news about Shelly. She had the PET scan, and they found that uh, the cancer has not uh, spread. So she's going to have, see, she doesn't need chemo. She's going to have her surgery on the 14th. Yeah. And, you know, once she recovers, she should be okay. So that's that's the news here. We do <laughs> Right. It's, it's really sad. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So you said, you know, I said, well, Donald Trump is going to be president. You know, we don't need to have your uh, Congress do this. You know, a lot of the time, people are just going to be dumb with money. And then when you bring it up, you're going to get reminded. Yeah. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Everything is out in the open. Anyway, I have to go, so uh, we'll we'll talk later. But uh, that's that's what's happening. Yeah, good stuff. All right, All right. take care.
Morning, Greg. Oh, let me unmute you. Okay. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Okay. Got a little yeah. growth going there. Yeah, that's because I wear a mask and it doesn't have to show. <laughs> <laughs> No, I got tired of shaving, so I shave about once a month. Okay, I shave every other day now, but. Uh... Okay, well, I don't have any anybody to really impress anymore. I'm not going anywhere. True, true. I have been playing cribbage with uh, West Covina. They've been playing in Monrovia. One of the uh, players there owns a, a hamburger place, a burger I am. And uh, about eight of us get together on Monday night and play six games. That's with uh, Norm Nicodine. Okay. His group. And uh, I can't participate in their championship, but I can earn points for my lifetime. Oh, all right. So that's good. You know. And they take some reasonable precautions? Uh I mean, uh, I'm wearing a mask. So a couple people wear masks. We have a large patio in the back of the burger place uh, that we can space out. So, yeah, we've been doing that. Uh, and we have hand sanitizer available. And uh, But as far as the uh, plant, you know, you're all touching the cards and the pegs. So I don't know. If you, if you want to wear gloves, you can wear gloves. But it 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 serves uh, it, it seems to be okay. But we've been shut down since uh, this last Monday because of the county. Yeah, uh. the county shut everybody down, so we're shut down for three weeks at least. Well, you seem to be healthy, so I guess it's all right. Yeah, I gained uh, some. I gained most of my weight back uh, because I'm not doing anything except eating. <laughs> crazy so how are you i'm fine i'm busy you know we're we're working from home okay and it it's functional we have uh, enough tools you know what to, kind of work do you do uh quality control for software oh, okay very good so we I didn't are know you, yeah i didn't know you were still working yeah i, I still have bills to pay <laughs> Yeah, me too. But I got a good, good uh, annuity from my retirement, so I'm doing okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so we expect a large group today. I don't know. We'll see. It's still a little early. Oh yeah. But. It's uh, <laughs> nine forty-eight. So I didn't know whether you'd be up or not. So I thought, okay. <laughs> I've been up for a while. I mean, as far as opening the Zoom. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'm getting pretty good at Zoom. Well, I use it almost every day, so. Yeah, three of my group, my Rotary Club uses it, and my uh, federal retirement group uses it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, then I'm also involved in uh, a couple of cancer research uh, uh, groups uh, with my prostate cancer and uh, they put on some good informational stuff so yeah are Very you uh, are you cancer free is it oh no no uh, I'll probably have it for the rest of my life it's a small portion and uh, we're doing what they call active surveillance which means a continuous check of uh, about every six months and a biopsy and MRI about once a year. But uh, it's it's small enough to not really do anything about it because there's more side effects in the treatment of it than there is if you just leave it alone. How did you know you had the problem? PSA levels went up. 
my blood okay. PSA numbers. <laughs> they went from a two to a three to a four uh, in three years. And the doctor said, time out. And so I immediately went to a urologist who did the biopsy and they found a small portion. And uh, he, he said then, he said, uh, it, you know, to try to treat it with anything, he says, you, you're going to have more side effects than you want to deal with. So they put me on active surveillance and believe it or not, a bunch of people are on active surveillance. So it, it's, you know, it's a common thing among people yeah. that have small amounts of cancer. So I'm okay. Okay, Robert, welcome. Let me try and unmute you here. Uh, we had somebody else coming in. Okay. Howard, Robert, welcome. Hello, thank you. Glad to have you here. Harold, Harold, sorry. Uh, Harold, I'm trying to unmute you. For some reason, it doesn't want to do that. He can unmute himself by hitting the uh, yeah, but, the microphone uh, icon. Yeah, maybe he doesn't want to. Okay, no, welcome, <laughs> welcome, Harold. Anyway, you're welcome to listen. Uh, Sometimes you wish they hadn't found the button to <laughs> open up their microphone. <laughs> uh. Okay, so we'll wait for the others to join us. <clears throat> Whoops, where'd he go? I think Carol is reconnecting here. Unless I accidentally knocked him off. Either that or sometimes if they have uh, weak connections, it'll knock you off uh, by itself. Yeah, maybe uh, that's what happened. That's why I moved my computer closer to my uh, connection. Because in the old house I'm in, I've got the connection one end of the house and then you got all these walls, these old walls with a lot of wood and stucco and stuff and the signal can't get through. Okay. Robert, what have you been up to? Uh, just staying at home and trying to stay safe. Okay, well, good. That's a good thing. This thing going to my angel games. Sure. I am going to go ahead and mute myself though for now. Okay, that's fine. All right, still, still have a few minutes. I don't know who Harold Howard is, but we lost him. <laughs> See if I can look him up somewhere else. Oh, there's a martial artist, there's an obituary. <laughs> I see that's not him. Thank you. 
Welcome. Ah, our speaker is here. Marsha, welcome. Let me unmute you. Actually, uh, Marsha, I'm making you a co-host. Oh, all right. In case you want to share something online. Yes, yeah, I, I have a whole uh, PowerPoint presentation I'll, I'll share, so thank you. Yeah, okay, that'll work. Uh, only a few so far. But it's still early. So what's uh, what's this Korean War book you're working on? Oh, it's um, it's uh, it's it centers around a character who's um, half African American, a half Korean, Korean mother, uh, African American soldier. Just kind of a, it's a pretty epic novel. It starts with the Korean War. It does incorporate a good deal of baseball. Uh, as part of the story, so it's yeah, my it's I'm co-writing with a friend of mine who lives down south. He lives in uh, Yorba Linda, so it's pretty fun. Oh, what's his name? Uh, Doug Weaver. He actually knows Tommy Los. He's uh, friends with Tommy Lasorda. He's known him okay. for a long time. So, because I I live in Yorba Linda. That's oh, wonderful. My yeah. uh my dad's parents uh, live there, and I actually uh did a couple internships at the Richard Nixon library in the summer of 2013. So I love your Belinda. Okay. Oh, yeah, wow. I, I live right around the block from the Nixon. library. Ah, wow. So yeah, Richard is my uh, neighbor. <laughs> oh. I take, uh, I take my dog walking past the library and uh, something about Nixon's presence seems to uh, stimulate his bowels. So <laughs> it's a good okay. spot. Of course it is. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't do any partisan stuff. Uh, I did some writing, but I also did like an archiving internship there. So oh, looks like we're starting to fill up here. Uh, just a few so far. Oh, good. Jeff is here. Tim, welcome. Good to see you. This is Jeff. Uh, no video yet from me. I can see you. Well, you can't actually see me. You see a picture of me when I was probably like six years old. Uh, well, a uh, um, a, a thing that looks like uh, Charlie Brown. Oh, that. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, I was looking. There's another Jeff. <laughs> Dr. Hubbard is with us as well. Okay. So... Uh, but anyway, we're happy to have you and Snoopy here. Yeah. I'll admit John. Okay, John, welcome. All right, yeah, we are starting to fill up here. It's nice. John, how you doing? Hi, Barry. Hi, everyone. Hey, John. Good to see you. Good to see you. Happy Saturday, everybody. Oh, we have another Jeff. Jeff Common is joining. Uh, Jeff Common will be part of the, uh, the second part of this meeting. Uh, hey, Jeff. So good. So anybody have any uh, good activities? Anybody doing any baseball related? Yes. Like yes. I'm having a uh, uh, an event, a virtual event with Topps baseball card photographer, Doug McWilliams next Sunday. Doug's also a Sabre member and uh, that'll be next Sunday on Patreon. And I also have a special offer of an autographed DVD copies of my film about Arnold Haino, 
si signed by Arnold Haino himself and me. And uh, I've got a, got a few of those available for special holiday offer. Yeah, well, I, I knew Doug well when I was up in, uh, in the Bay Area. And uh, I hope he's doing well. He is. He's 83, and uh, he, he looks great. And uh, he's donated, I think, over 10,000 images to the Hall of Fame from his baseball card career. Yeah. Is he still doing photography? Um, I don't know, to be fair. Um, I think he's just trying to get all of his pictures together in order because he's going to be donating more to the Hall of Fame. And, of course, Doug documented the PCL going far back. as uh, Right. He worked, yeah, he worked with Dick Dobbins. Yes. Yeah, Doug also has a picture of every Nobel Prize winner. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, you should ask him about that collection. I'm going to. So, Bill, welcome. Let's see, where are you here? Glad to be here. Okay. And Barry, did you know that uh, Doug McWilliams' favorite Oakland Oak that he grew up with was Artie Wilson? Okay. Okay. I know he spent a lot of time at the uh, at the ballpark there. Yeah. And speaking of the Oakland Oaks, the PCL reunion is next Saturday. Are you aware of that? No. How do we participate, Pat? You know, I I always send in my dues to uh... Mark McRae. Oh, okay. You know, I haven't gotten anything from Mark since he, since Beveridge turned it over to him. Oh my! Huh? You should be on the mailing list. Yeah. He That's sent out, He sent out an invitation to attend the PCL reunion. They've got a hundred slots, and so um, I'll forward you a copy of that. I'll bring it up on my PC here. I wonder if it's already filled up. John, do you need a copy? Yes, please, Pat. Thank you. Okay. So that's next Saturday. What time? I believe at uh, 10 o'clock. Okay. Um, but I'll double check that. Uh, Bill Nolan, I made you a co-host. I saw that, actually, and I let in Dixie. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Okay, good. What other activities do we have going on? Well, next uh, Saturday is the Sabre Baseball Memories uh, uh, group, I forget how we call them, Reminiscent. interest group. Um, and it's the uh, Reminiscence Therapy uh, program. We're, we're working with uh, various, um, you know, uh, dementia-based groups and so forth, and we're getting them started around the country. We have about 50 Sabre members who are involved, and that's going to be next uh, next uh, Saturday at one o'clock, and invite all here who are interested. Uh, Jeff Hubbard, who's on here with us, is my partner here uh, doing this with Alzheimer's Los Angeles, and of course, I work with Barry on this program for the Veterans Administration, and it's, it's going great guns, and it's doing great work, and it's a great opportunity for Sabre members to be involved. Okay. So what's happening in Boston? We have a couple Rain. of Massachusetts people. Rain. Okay. Well, it's let's uh, see if there's going to be a season next year. Yeah. It's going to be on it. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, <clears throat> what is it, about 70 degrees and sunny here in California. So. Except we can't go outside. <laughs> okay, Marsha, why don't we wait uh, about five minutes for a few more people to join? <clears throat> Maximize your audience. Sure thing. Thank you. 
Uh, well, good. Any uh, anybody following the trades or the trade talk? Somewhat. Um, if this main thing is whether or not the Dodgers bring back uh, Justin Turner. You know, it's just kind of the main thing. Just kind of keep third base sol and the bullpen solvent. Otherwise, nothing too urgent there in my eyes. Yeah. Pretty set the way they are. <laughs> well, there's talk about uh, getting, going after Arenado, too. Yes, which is exciting, although I'd be hesitant to uh, part with Josiah Gray, but I don't know. could be worth it. Is David Price going to play next year? Oh, I'm certain he will. Um, I hope he does. I, that was just so exciting to, to get him. He, that got ignored when we got Mookie. It's like we got a Cy Young winner too. But, yeah, I, I hope he pitches next year. He's a cool guy. And they won without him. Won without him, I know. <laughs> I wonder if he kind of had some second – some second thoughts about it when, when they won, but you know, safety first well, and all that. Would he be Speak human if he didn't? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Speaking from Boston, have fun with Mookie Betts, but I was kind of wondering what's the reaction locally to Justin Turner after that fiasco at the very end of the World Series? Ooh, mixed. Uh, I, I wasn't too thrilled. I'm a, a longtime Turner fan. wasn't too thrilled with his actions myself, but I can't speak on behalf of everyone. Yeah. The team seemed to apologize for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's seen locally as a really good guy, very involved in the community. Um, and, you know, the, the press hammered him pretty hard, in, at least in the LA Times. And, um, you know, it seemed like the Dodgers and MLB could have done a much better job restricting him from going out there. So there seemed to be blame all around. And yes, no, I agree. I, uh, I was also going to add, I, I, I personally also think Turner still gets blamed because he, he has to know when you test positive, you got to quarantine immediately. So I don't know. Blair, I agree though, blame to go all around. I like to blame uh, MLB a lot more than I do individual players for every issue. Oh. oh, no, I agree. Well, I blame MLB for the the product, the lack of protocols. It wasn't even really much of a bubble. Like uh, Blake Trinan and Joe Kelly said, yeah, there were like golfers from people from out of town who were in the hotel. And I just thought it, it's either a bubble or it's not like the NBA. So, yeah, M MLB really let their guard down with that. It's not good. Well, Par for the course, a lot of times. Yeah. Baseball's current government isn't exactly the most coordinated government you'll ever see. <laughs> no, it is not. I'd expect nothing less from Manfred. Well, I couldn't. Then it gets like again, it gets worse. <laughs> it keeps getting worse. Yeah, Commissioner yeah. Nero fiddles while baseball burns. He really is. He really is. I mean, there are times that he doesn't seem to be aware that he has particular power to act in the best interest of baseball. And then when he is aware of it, it seems like to him, the common good of the game is strictly making money for it. That's it. That's all he cares about. I always say if it doesn't involve more money, he doesn't care about it. You know, he's... And he, and he continues the tradition of his former boss where if it is broke... It'll fix itself. If it's not broke, <laughs> call the repair people. Exactly. <laughs> well put. And even, and even when he is on the side of the angels, he manages to screw the pooch. Yep. <sighs> okay, well, oh, uh, our... why don't we get started here? All right. uh, Marshall is a uh, book author in, uh, in Davis, California for the... Uh, Research group history specialist. He's a video game critic for the Screen Rant. Uh, is that a magazine? Or? Uh, it's a website. 
website. Okay. I was previously a writer for Dodgers Nation, a leading blog. Uh, Co-founder, lead editor of Last Token Gaming, a video game blog. He's active in the Dusty Baker chapter up in Sacramento. Board member for the Sacramento Historical Society. He's going to talk to us today about his uh, book, The Hidden History of Sacramento Baseball. And he's working on a book about the 1985 World Series and a novel on the Korean War. Uh, Marshall, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, so for today, I'm going to give a little slide presentation. This will be just sort of a cliff notes about uh, Sacramento baseball history. And then I will read an excerpt from a chapter in my book. So let me just start screen share here. Does that look good? Yes. All right. Here we go. Good. When one thinks of California baseball in regional terms, cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, and Oakland likely come to mind first, especially when the subject comes to areas that can lay claim to historic firsts for baseball in the Golden State. It may come as a surprise to many to learn that, despite never once being home to a major league franchise, Sacramento has pioneered baseball's growth in the Golden State at almost every major juncture since the mid-19th century. It isn't just the influence of California and Pacific Coast League teams like the Gilt Edge, Solons, and Rivercats that make Sacramento so vital to the history of our national pastime. The River City is also a fertile training ground for legions of esteemed players, coaches, and managers, whether by birth, high school, and college upbringing, or a minor league stint with a local team, a manifold armada of baseball heroes have been, and continue to be, forged by the capital city. Dusty Baker, Larry Boa, Steve Sachs, Stan Hack, Brad Lidge, Bob and Ken Forsh, Buck Martinez, J.P. Howell, R.J. Reynolds, John McNamara, Jerry Manuel, Derek Lee, Greg Vaughn, Earl McNeely, Fernando Vina, and Duster Males are just a few examples of big names with deep roots in Sacramento. And here you can see just four of those gentlemen, Hack, McNeely, uh, Reynolds, a uh, Dodger from the 80s, and of course, Johnny B. Baker himself. Uh, long before any of those names were even born, though, baseball, as it was referred to in two words back then, began to take hold in the city in the late 1850s. There is evidence of a team in Sacramento as early as November 1859, according to an article in the Daily Union. The next year, however, featured what I consider to be the true starting point of Sacramento's seminal baseball legacy, and fittingly so, considering how pivotal 1860 was in the bigger picture of history. By then, California had been a U.S. state for a full decade. In April, a solitary horse and rider rode from St. Joseph, Missouri, to Sacramento with a sack of mail, establishing the Pony Express. On November 6th, California voters narrowly went for Republican nominee Abraham Lincoln in the U.S. presidential election, helping him win the White House and setting the stage for the Civil War. In December, construction workers broke ground for the state capitol building in Sacramento. But before all of this, on February 22nd, Sacramento hosted the first official complete game of baseball in the state's history. At the baseball tournament of the California State Fair, the San Francisco Eagles defeated the Sacramento Club to claim a silver ball trophy. Nine years later, an even bigger event occurred in September 1869. The Cincinnati Red Stockings, generally regarded as the first openly professional baseball team in the United States, came to town as part of their nationwide barnstorming tour, and they squared off with a ragtag group of local players. The final score? Cincinnati 50, Sacramento 6. It was so lopsided, it didn't even go the full nine innings, and had to be called after just seven. In the 1880s, after professional baseball had truly taken off in the U.S., the Sacramento Altas joined the California League, the incipient professional league in the state. And on the left there, you can see an Altas scorecard. The end of the 19th century saw the arrival of the city's best team yet, the Gilt Edge. That's the gentleman on the right. Named after a beer brewed by the local Roostaller Brewery, the team won three consecutive California League championships in 1898, 1899, and 1900. However, 
It was 1903 that witnessed the biggest development for baseball in the Golden State yet. In the same year as the inaugural MLB World Series, the Pacific Coast League was established. With a massive schedule, no salary limits, and teams in Oregon and Washington, it was an unprecedented circuit for pro ball on the West Coast. Once again, Sacramento was at the forefront. The former Gilt Edge, now christened the Senators, hosted the first ever PCL game on March 26th. It was played at their stadium in the Oak Park region of Sacramento, and the Senators rallied late for a 7-4 to win over Oakland. And here you can see a picture of a motor parade that went all the way down downtown to Oak Park. Unfortunately, one of the cars sputtered out, so the players in that car had to hop in a hay wagon to get to the ballpark. For the next couple decades, the Senators didn't accomplish too much and were even put out of commission for a few years during World War I. The most notable, de notable development for the team came in 1910 with the opening of Buffalo Park on 11th and Y Streets, Riverside and Broadway today, which would become the home of the franchise for the next half century. Uh, and you can see right here, this is a photo taken at Buffalo Park. However, they gained a new consistent identity in 1919 when they were purchased by Lou Mooring, a builder from Stockton. There he is right there. After years of joint ownership under different owners, Mooring's deep pockets and ambitious sole stewardship from 1920 to 1933 guided the team to many historic firsts. For starters, he renovated the stadium and renamed it Mooring Field. In 1923, they won a franchise record 112 games. In 1928, they made the PCL playoffs for the first time. The biggest first, though, was on June 10th, 1930, on this night, Sacramento played host to the first ever night game in Pacific Coast League history. And as far as I know, probably the first in California pro baseball history altogether, as it was relatively new at the time. The rest of the PCL was impressed and quickly started hosting their own night games shortly thereafter. Moreover, it was well ahead of the curve five years before MLB's first night game at Crosley Field in Cincinnati. And you can take a look here on the left side the gentleman there uh, with the white sleeve, I know it's pretty dark, obviously. That's uh, Governor C.C. C. Young. Um, Mooring was also responsible for signing the first player of Japanese heritage in PCL history, pitcher Kenso Nushida in 1932. This was a full 32 years before MLB's first Japanese player, Masanori Murakami of the Giants. Also worth noting that during the Mooring era, Sacramento received a visit from Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. Just after the hollowed 1927 New York Yankees won the World Series, the two went on a barnstorming tour in California in late October. On October 25th, the Bustin' Babes and La Rupin Lou's, aided by a few of the Senators themselves, took the grass at Mooring Field. Gehrig's squad won 10-7. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos of their game in sack, but that is them on that tour. In spite of all these feats, Lou Mooring's financial troubles from the Great Depression eventually caught up with him leading to Banks taking over the team temporarily in 1934. But that was just an intermediary step to the franchise's halcyon days. The team, rechristened the Solons, was purchased by the St. Louis Cardinals towards the end of 1935. The Cardinals were not only a championship powerhouse, but under general manager Branch Rickey, they had pioneered the modern-day minor league format of a tiered system of clubs to develop talent for a major league affiliate. The Solons were now a key cog in that machine, and it didn't take long for them to reap the benefits. From 1936 to 1944, the Solons enjoyed their most consistent era. They were flush with talent, with players like slugger Art Garibaldi, that's the gentleman on the left, and ace pitcher Tony Freitas, he's the one on the right. They made the postseason five times, winning consecutive President's Cup playoffs in 1938 and 1939. Their crowning moment, however, was in 1942, when they won their only outright PCL pennant in franchise history in a miraculous finish I'll detail when I read its chapter portion a bit later. All right, there on the left, that's Tony Freitas again. On the right, player manager Pepper Martin. Unfortunately, that miracle win proved the veritable peak for the Solons. The Cardinals' ownership ended in 1944. They had a couple more playoff appearances in the 40s. They even survived having their stadium, renamed Edmonds Field, burned to the ground in 1948. On the left, you can see the fire, the before, and then the after, 1949. A beautiful rebuild. That's amazing they pulled it off that well. The 1950s, however, 
were an unmitigated disaster. The team was perennially awful, mustering just one winning record and one 500 record to punctuate the cellar dwelling. They didn't lack good players during this time. The likes of Wally Westlake, Nippy Jones, John McNamara, Gene Bearden, Ray Dandridge, and Joe Gordon suited up for Sacramento in the 50s. A uh, bunch of those names you can see here, that's the 56 Solons. They finished 500, so they were one of the few you know, respectable ones. They also signed their first black players in franchise history, Marvin Williams and Walt McCoy in 1950. Williams is on the left and McCoy is on the right. That was even well before some MLB teams integrated. Yet they failed to make the playoffs even once. Even hiring old fan favorite Tony Freitas' as manager did little to solve the problem. They didn't lack for ambitious ownership either. By the midpoint of the decade, they were losing money and nearly moved to Vancouver. Fred David, that's the gentleman on the left, a Sacramento candy and restaurant businessman with ties to the franchise going back to his youth, became majority owner in 1954. He throatily promised to keep them in Sacramento until hell freezes over. Unfortunately, that promise didn't come true. Not only did the Solons keep losing games and bleeding money, but as we all know, Major League Baseball came to California in 1958 with the Dodgers and the Giants. Most eminently, the arrival of the Giants in San Francisco just over an hour away had an immediate impact on the Solons. More people opted to attend games at Seal Stadium or listen to the heroics of Willie Mays and Orlando Cepeda on the radio rather than go to Edmonds Field. After decades of peaks and valleys, including surviving many prior financial troubles and threats to move, the end for the Solons finally came after the 1960 season. In January 1961, they moved to Hawaii to become the Islanders. Painfully, in the year that marked the beginning of MLB's expansion era, no less, Sacramento was now without professional baseball. Edmonds Field sat unoccupied for several more years, although it would have one last hurrah before its demolition. On April 11th and 12th, 1964, the SF Giants and Cleveland Indians played a pair of exhibition games there. Cleveland infi infielder Woody Held, a Sacramento native, was the program cover boy, and you can see him right there. The Giants won both of these games thanks to their vaunted power tandem of Willie Mays and Willie McCovey. And there's a great photo of the say hey kid himself, Willie Mays, taking a big hack. Weeks later, after these games, Edmonds Field was demolished to make way for a Gemco store, and today it's the location of a Target. Fortunately, the succession of chain stores hasn't erased every last trace of baseball lore there. Inside the exit of Target, there lies a plaque dedicated to Edmonds Field and the legacy of the Senators and Solons. However, for the rest of the 60s and into the early 70s, Sacramento was nonetheless still without a pro team. Even as California added three more MLB teams during the, during the expansion era, the Angels, the Padres, and the Athletics. By the time the mid-70s rolled around, baseball would admittedly seem to be the farthest thing from the minds of Sacramentans. The OPEC embargo, the Vietnam War, Watergate, the near assassination of President Gerald Ford near the Capitol building downtown, and even a viral disease outbreak in the Carmichael area made for a particularly turbulent time. Yet in late 1973, Bob Piccinini, owner of Save Mart Supermarkets, purchased the Eugene Emeralds of the PCL, moving them to Sacramento. Now, I know the photo's a little blurry here, but the, the, the gentleman there, a third from the right holding the document, that's Piccinini. The man in the, uh, with the hat with his arm out, that's uh, Sacramento Mayor Richard Marriott. So this new team, reviving the Solon's moniker, would serve as the minor league training ground for notable players like Gorman Thomas, Sixto Lescano, Len Barker, Greg Pryor, and Bump Wills, son of Dodgers legend Maury Wills. However, they only lasted three seasons, largely due to their inability to secure a stadium of their own. They didn't have a winning record in any of those seasons either. With Edmonds Field long torn down, they had to temporarily use the football and track field at Sacramento City College, Hughes Stadium. Much like when the Dodgers played at the LA Coliseum, the odd dimensions created a truncated left field that led to an absurd amount of home runs, and it especially made developing uh, pitching difficult. And I know this is kind of a cutoff photo, but you can get a little sense here. You can see how close the, out, the left field wall is. So again, like the Coliseum, like Wally Moon and his moonshots, you had a lot of those. 
After the 1976 season, every attempt to land a new park having failed, they were moved to Ogden, Utah. What followed was a two-decade absence for professional baseball in Sacramento. There were some attempts to build a new stadium and get a new team, including one in the early 90s as MLB added more expansion teams, but nothing came to fruition. That all changed towards the, towards the end of the 90s when businessman Art Savage purchased the AAA Vancouver Canadians from a group of Japanese investors. Savage, an instrumental figure for the expansion San Jose Sharks of the NHL, intended to move the team to Sacramento. However, there were a few hurdles to overcome. The biggest was the need for a new stadium, especially after the Hughes Stadium limbo that doomed the 70s Solons. This new stadium would need a brand new state-of-the-art ballpark. A location was eventually designated in West Sacramento, right by the city's hollowed tower bridge and the banks of the Sacramento River. The stadium, named Rayleigh Field, was a miracle of breakneck construction. After ground bro was broken in late 1999, what would normally be an 18-month project managed to be finished in just eight and a half months. Although it did push Sacramento's long-awaited new home opener to May 15th. The last detail was the team's name. Rather than revive the Solons once again, it was decided by team officials to leave it to a fan contest. The winner was ultimately the Rivercats, a name that admittedly drew some derision at the time. But money would do the loudest talking, as the Rivercats would go on to lead the miners in merchandising sales. Besides, it certainly beat other suggestions like the River City Fighting Salmon and the Sacramento Bureaucrats. <laughs> The Rivercats would make the playoffs in 2000, a taste of the years to come. In their two decades of operate, exact decades of operation since, the Rivercats have been, in my opinion, the model franchise for all of minor league baseball. They have repeatedly been ranked by Forbes as the most valuable minor league franchise in the country. Uh, their stadium, recently renamed Sutter Health Park, is frequently heralded as one of the best minor league par ballparks in the nation. They have produced, produced waves of impactful players. Barry Zito, Mark Mulder, Ryan Ludwig, Santiago Casilla, Sean Doolittle, Mark Bellhorn, Carlos Gonzalez, Joe Blanton, Josh Donaldson, Nick Swisher, Gio Gonzalez, and Miguel Tejada are a few examples. On the left, you can see Barry Zito back in 2000. And on top there, I love this picture. This is Nick Swisher and I think either 2003 or 2004 getting close with the fans there. In their early years, when they were the AAA affiliate of the Oakland Athletics, of course, today they're the affiliate of the, of the Giants, the Rivercats helped shape the money ball class of players that revolutionized Major League Baseball. Although he was only there briefly before being traded to the Dodgers, Captain Clutch himself, Andre Ethier, was briefly a Rivercat as well. Four games. Most importantly, they have maintained a level of consistent success that only that even a handful of major league teams would aspire to. They've won 12 division titles, five Pacific Coast League titles, seven Pacific Conference titles, and three AAA championships in 2007, 2008, and most recently 2019. And that's them celebrating the title in 2019 right there. Altogether, the Rivercats mark a veritable culmination for the varied, pioneering legacy of baseball in Sacramento. When you put it all together, from the nascent games of the 19th century to the PCL innovation of the Senators and so on, from the dozens of esteemed players to the fascinating episodes like Ruth and Garrick barnstorming and the Giants sending off Edmonds Field, it's clear that there's no baseball town quite like Sacramento. If anything, the lack of a major league team only makes the River City's vitality, vitality to the trajectory of the game all the better. And... That's it for the slideshow. And now I'll read you a quick passage and then I'll take some questions. So this is the, an excerpt about the, mir the miraculous 1942 pennant. The dawn of the 1940s, much like the beginning of the previous decade, was defined by world, world events far bigger than baseball. In the fall of 1939, around the time the Solons were heading for another playoff title, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, officially commencing World War II. In June of 1940, Adolf Hitler's ruthless panzer divisions conquered France. Unlike the Great Depression at the outset of the 30s, however, the impact hadn't reached the United States just yet. Baseball continued unperturbed for the moment, and Solon's fans in particular expected another postseason run to commence the new decade. 
But 1940 would demonstrate the sobering reality of being a minor league affiliate, as Branch Rickey, Branch Rickey constantly cycled players throughout St. Louis's vast farm system all year long. The usually reliable Art Garibaldi experienced a down year and was unwillingly shipped to San Diego in July. First baseman Larry Barton's similarly underwhelming bat sent him to Columbus. Luckily, fan favorite Tony Freitas wasn't traded away, although he led the staff in unfavorable categories like runs allowed and losses. Injuries only made things worse, with outfielder Dick Lang and infielder Roy Flegger both suffering broken legs. The end result was 90 wins and a fifth-place finish, a disappointing follow-up to back-to-back President's Cup wins. After a mediocre season, Ricky unsurprisingly opted to hire a new manager to galvanize his club. His choice was an outstanding one, John Pepper Martin. Memorably nicknamed the Wild Horse of Osage, Martin distinguished himself as a member of the Cardinals' Gas House Gang championship teams of the 1930s. As a player, his aggressive base running, head-first slides, and nimble outfield work earned him comparisons to Ty Cobb. Most importantly, he was the key factor in St. Louis's upset World Series victory over the Philadelphia Athletics in 1931. For Martin, it was perfect timing. His relentlessly physical style of play ended up taking a severe toll on his body, necessitating retirement from the majors. But he was ready for a second act as a manager and could still handle minor league playing. When Ricky signed him as manager, Martin eagerly promised to bring Gas House Gang baseball to the River City, in addition to patrolling right field. In February of 1941, Martin, accompanied by his wife, three daughters, and two dogs, drove 1,600 miles from Oklahoma to their new rental home in Sacramento. Accordingly, the roster was reshaped in a way that promised playoff contention. Tony Freitas once again led the pitching staff supplemented by the likes of Bill Schmidt, Red Munger, and Albert Boots Hollingsworth. New Orleans hard-hitting shortstop Frank Scalzi was acquired in a big trade to fill the the void left by Buddy Blattner's transition to second base. Newly acquired first baseman Maurice Sturdy's offense befit his surname, thanks to his 295 average with Columbus in 1940. Second was covered by Don Gutteridge, who possessed the kind of speed Martin sought to bring to the team just as he had himself in St. Louis. Martin's first season proved to be as excellent as hoped. The 1941 Solons crackled with the kind of gritty energy and tenacity that defined the Gas House Gang Cardinals. They stole bases at a dizzying clip, hustled for infield hits, and stupefied opposing defenses. Yet they weren't limited to just small ball, launching 41 home runs by June. The pitching was brilliant, not only in the ample starting rotation, but the bullpen as well. The sports press raved about the team, with Will Connolly of the San Francisco Chronicle dubbing them the most spectacular ball club to show in the Coast League in a long time. At the midpoint of June, they were a staggering 50 and 19, 14 games ahead in first place, and had already entertained over 100,000 fans. Eight players, Martin included, represented Sacramento at the PCL All Star game in San Francisco. The second half would prove to be far less entertaining. A series of injuries and a slumping offense caused the team to lose 14 of their last 27 games when Pepper Martin night occurred on July 11th at Cardinal Field. Despite the slump, the Solons remained 10 games ahead in first, and 14,300 showed up to shower their indefatigable manager with gifts and praise. With his wife at his side, an emotional Martin could barely speak as he surveyed a parade of gifts such as a 1941 Chrysler New Yorker four-door sedan, a shotgun, a hunting dog, and a new set of dishes. Unfortunately, the joy of that night didn't last Martin the rest of the season. While driving his new vehicle with his wife on a night trip to Marysville, he was run off the road by another driver. Incensed, Martin walked up to the other vehicle and punched the driver, dislocating a finger in the process. The Solons went into a nosedive in August and September, suddenly losing games as profusely as they won them in the first half. The end result was still a strong 102 and 75, but they finished second to Seattle. Similar to the 30s, the President's Cup playoff offered a chance to end the season on a strong note. They easily swept San Diego in the first round to meet Seattle, taking a 3-2 series lead thanks to the pitching of Freitas and Munger. But Seattle fought back valiantly to win the final two games, claiming the Cup. Just like in 1937, A postseason disappointment only served to whet Sacramento fans' appetite for even better results the next year. 
But the 1941 offseason would be greatly overshadowed by a shocking development in the war. On December 7th, Japanese fighter pilots attacked the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and America finally entered the conflict. The growth of World War II had indeed been prevalent in people's minds all throughout 1941. Sacramento Bee sports writer Wilbur Adams likened the Solon's aggressive style of play to Hitler's panzer divisions during the first half. Even with the U.S. now officially in the war, baseball continued in Sacramento in 1942. Across the nation, the game was almost immediately impeded by the war effort. The U.S. government restricted the crowd size at all sporting events, fearing they could present an attractive, tar attractive target for enemy forces. Night games on the West Coast were eliminated in tandem with wartime power restrictions. MLB Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis even contacted President Franklin D. Roosevelt, asking whether baseball should go on in 1942, with Roosevelt insisting the game should continue for the country's morale. Luckily, the Solons were largely unaffected by the draft and fielded a team as, as capable as their almost champion the year prior. Tony Freitas and Bill Schmidt returned in the starting rotation, this time aided by Sylvester Blix Donnelly, Kemp Wicker, and Clarence Spears. The outfield was entirely new, anchored by Tommy Thompson, Bill Shuey, and Debs Garms. Infielder Eddie Lake, who had spent the previous three seasons with St. Louis, brought much needed depth. Ray Muller, a cousin of 1941 second baseman Don Gutteridge, provided a sturdy presence behind the plate and another powerful bat. And of course, Pepper Martin led the way as player manager once more. Throughout the season, the Solons won consistently and hovered around first and second place. But more often than not, it seemed like 1942 was defined more by tribulation off the field. The realities of the war were ever present, none grimmer than in May. Earlier in February, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which ordered all Japanese Americans to be rounded up and sent to internment camps. On May 7th, the U.S. Army ushered 3,800 people of Japanese descent into the halls of Memorial Auditorium in downtown Sacramento for transfer to the prison at Tula Lake in Siskiyou County. In July, the team dealt with a tragic loss when former catching prospect Jim Grilk suddenly died in an automobile accident in nearby Woodland. While he wasn't playing for the Solons at the present time, he had been in Sacramento working as an athletic director at the Sacramento Army Air Base. Perhaps appropriately, the Solons dropped out of first place behind Los Angeles. Attendance was stagnant all season regardless, chiefly due to the lack of night games and the extended time commitment working in industry to create war goods. As the season neared its final weekend, there seemed little reason to hope for a return to the playoffs. The final series was a seven-game homestand at Cardinal Field, but it was against none other than the Los Angeles Angels. Predictably, the Angels won the first two games, putting Sacramento four games out of first with just five left to play. If the Solons wanted to claim their elusive first PCL pennant, they had to win every single game. In the third game, the Solons lived to see another day, thanks to an unlikely walk-off. In the bottom of the ninth, third baseman Steve Mesner scored the winning run when the Los Angeles defense threw away a routine double play. Given the fact that the Angels were the best fielding squad in the PCL, uh, winning a game on an error by them was borderline miraculous. The next game on Friday was a standard pitching masterpiece by Freitas, while the offense backed him up with 17 hits and 10 runs. All of a sudden, the Solons trailed by just two games with three to play. The first was set for Saturday, and the last two as a doubleheader on Sunday. Sat Saturday's game upped the drama considerably, going all the way to the 11th inning. The Angels took the lead in the top half, needing just three outs to clinch the pennant. But after a walk to Buster Adams, pinch hitter Gene Lillard slammed a home run for a 6-5 to five walk off win. Yet the drama was hardly over, as the Solons trailed late in the first game of Sunday's doubleheader. 11,600 fans at Cardinal Field watched their team head into the bottom of the 8th down five to three. Suddenly, the Solons erupted for four runs, including a two-run homer by Ray Muller. Freitas stepped into the fray in the ninth and sent the Angels down in order, officially tying for first place. Already warmed up sufficiently by closing out game one, Freitas then started game two, twirling a four-hit, five-to-one victory. Against all odds, the Sacramento Solons were undisputed PCL champions for the first time ever. It was a spectacular finish in every way, 
one befitting of a baseball movie like The Natural. In a year where the grim specter of war loomed large and the team dealt with the death of a former player, the victory carried greater resonance. To sweeten things even further, the St. Louis Cardinals won their fourth World Series the very next month. That's quite a story. It is. And uh, I'll uh, take questions if anyone's got any questions. But how, how long do you want to go with questions? Well, let, let's see what we have. All right. Marshall, you mentioned Earl McNeely earlier. Yep. Um, he was the uh, owner of the, the Solons or before they were the Solons, he was the owner of the Sacramento franchise for a short period and also their manager, wasn't he? You are 100% correct. After the banks, uh, California banks took over the team because Lou Mooring just, just kind of, Lou Mooring just kind of didn't show up for a big hearing. The banks took over the team and McNeely was kind of the de facto like owner, kind of the figurehead. So yeah, he, was the owner. He came back as manager for 1934 and I think 35 as well. Also did some playing again, managed to kind of tap back into a fountain of youth like when he played in the 20s. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yep, you are spot on. I met his daughter, his, uh, his granddaughter uh, oh. about, uh, I don't know, four months ago. Uh, and Learned a lot about Earl McNeely at that time. Oh, that's so sweet. <clears throat> yep. Uh, Greg, uh, I yeah. think you go ahead. I have a comment. Uh, I enjoyed your book and read it. And uh, uh, one of the people that you interviewed, Danny Vistica, uh, I grew up with him in San Pedro. We went to high school and grammar school together. Oh, and my gosh. Yeah, we still meet each other. We're graduates of 1968, and we still meet each other with an alumni of the senior group from Furman Lost the Wind, where we went to high school. Oh. And, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He is uh, he's so such a sweet guy. I know he's obviously a big Dodger fan. I remember when I interviewed him at his office at Rayleigh Field, he had a, a ticket, I think, from uh, Koufax's perfect game in 1965. Yeah, he is such a class act. I'm so thank you for telling me that. It's a great coincidence, and I'm, I'm glad to hear he's doing well. So thank you. Yeah, he uh, no longer with the team, but him and his son, I think, uh, have a business going right now associated with baseball. They do. Yeah, I, I, I knew that he had left the team, but yeah, he's, he's still doing well on the business front. So thank you so much. Uh, David, I think. Hi, this is David Holtz. Uh, I, I just want to mention, um, uh, I, I grew up following baseball in the 19, 1950s, and my memory <clears throat> was uh, Sacramento was the doormat of the league. Yep. My, my team was the Angels. But the question I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned that night baseball came around in the 1930s. But what I remember from those early days was that uh, when they had day baseball, which was quite common, especially on Sundays, not in Sacramento because of the heat, they would play at night. Uh, and it was unusual that uh, that was the one place where that was done. I also remember that Joe Gordon was the playing manager of the Solons during that time. Interesting. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Joe Gordon was there for 50 and 51 just after he was done in the majors. The team wasn't good, but he hit terrific because, of course, he's Joe Gordon. That's interesting about night baseball. Um, if it didn't, because, you know, according to John Spaulding, Sac uh, Sacramento Senators and Solons, which was kind of my main source for my book, you know, the other teams adopted night baseball, but I, that's interesting here. It wasn't done quite as much in some of those cities. I'll, I, I, I want to do, I want to do more research about that. Thank you for telling me about that. This is Jeff in Las Vegas. Speaking of night ball, my understanding was that not only with Sacramento, but in those years, the Negro leagues were playing night games and often as not bringing traveling lights to where they played in that decade. This, you know, this was well before Cincinnati turned on the lights. 
Yes, um, I'm. I, I'm so glad you brought that up too because I have to admit, I uh, Negro Leagues is one of my big subjects that I want to really dive deeper into and know more about. That doesn't surprise me that the Negro Leagues would be ahead of the curve on night baseball. Do you know? Uh, do you by any chance know the first year uh, that that they did? I know some may, Negro League. Go ahead. It may have been 1931, and it might have been the Kansas City Monarchs who started the whole thing. Yeah, May. It was. <laughs> Oh, great. it was. OK, so that'd be just a year after Sacramento then. But that's still that's still ahead of the curve. And that's still before Major League Baseball did it. So thank you. Sure. Also, I wanted to know how long I haven't read your book yet and I plan to. But how long did Pepper Martin manage the team? Um, Let me look here. I'm glad you brought that up. Here, I'll head to the uh, – I wrote about him a bit more in the uh, – I have a whole chapter here where I talk about 50 great players and coaches with a Sacramento connection. Um, uh, I, it looks to be about maybe 44. It said he retired – I wrote here he retired in 1944 and then spent uh, many years as a manager for other teams. So – I, I will have to check in, but I'm going to guess I think it ended in 44 because that's the year the Cardinals and the Solons parted ways. So that would make sense. Right. It, it does. I, I saw the River Cats in 2019. The bad news was that the Las Vegas Aviators smothered them 11 to 3. <laughs> well, luckily, I think it was the Aviators' second home game of the season. I wanted to see the new ballpark and to see the team, and it was an 11 to 3 blowout. Oof. Well, luckily my cats bounced back from that. I actually got to see one of the uh, the the playoff games en route to their title, so that was pretty fun. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Marshall, I have a question about the River Cats. Mm -hmm. You featured a, a photograph late in your presentation that was a, of the entire team, a recent River Cats team, mm -hmm. and way over on the right hand side, of course, I noticed there was one woman in the photograph. Now, when I was looking at it, it kind of rang a bell. And please, if you know anything about this, tell me if I'm right. Is she the uh, the basis for a television show that's being filmed starring Felicity Huffman as her, as that woman? Is she some um, muckety muck on the team? Do you know anything about that? Have you heard anything? Um, I have no knowledge about it. Uh, okay. I actually don't know who she is. I, I just, I was just looking for like team photos and I was actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I was wondering if that, if that might be, uh, uh, Art Savage's daughter at first, because Art Savage passed away in two, they actually died on my birthday in 2009. And so the, his kids, you know, the family took it over, just kept it going. So I wasn't sure who the woman there was, but I'm going to go back to where I got that image and I'll, uh, I'll let you know what I find. Okay. Yeah. I think it was, she's either a team owner or um, some higher up in the team, um, you know, uh, hierarchy. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, a TV show is being made, I think by a major network and Felicity Huffman, who was ABC. just recently released. Sorry. ABC, I believe. Okay. There you go. All right. So somebody else has heard about it. So. Yeah, it was announced this week, and it's pretty amazing uh, because you know baseball is pretty much the kiss of death when it comes to uh, broadcast television. <laughs> it's, it's That's nice true. To, it's nice to see that it's uh, that that project is happening. Good. It is, and there's also another one um, being made by Amazon that is a total retooling of the a League mm. of Their Own show that was such a bomb 20 25 years ago when it was on tv very briefly as a series um, but amazon is making a series out of it a limited series and they're they've already filmed i think half of the first season and good re good reviews are coming out of um, my sources so we have two tv shows about baseball to look forward to and hopefully they'll both do well hope so too i'll uh <laughs> I'll look into that. Thank you for bringing that up, Perry. I appreciate that. Hey, thank you for doing all that great research about uh, Sacramento baseball. Because you know that I have a very um, familial tie with my uh, great uncle, Jim McLaughlin, who played most of his career with the Sacramento Solons and then played one game with the St. Louis Browns in 1932. So I'm getting closer to finding out the uh, 
progression of events that led up to that happening. And thank you for um, doing all that research. Really appreciate it. No problem. Uh, Mike, I see you got a question there. Uh, two, two people you mentioned who played on the Salons. One was Buddy Blattner. Was that the Angel broadcaster in the 60s? Hmm. I, that, that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, let me take a look here. Buddy Blattner. Yes. Yep. Radio and tell. Yeah, yeah, he was. Radio oh, wow. and television broadcaster. Yeah. Buddy and Blattner was more famous for doing uh, with Dizzy Dean the game of the week in the 50s. Oh. I, didn't, I have to confess I didn't know that. Wow. Know. Yeah. And then my second question is you mentioned a pitcher named Clarence Dears. I grew up in Fresno and the Cal, you know, in the sixties, the California League, and there's an umpire by that name. Is that by chance? Do you know if that might be the same person? Let me take a look there again. I, I wish I could profile all of the players that I name dropped in my book. There's only room for so many. Um, let's see here. Hmm. That I can't seem to find anything, but my guess would be yes. I mean, that's such a distinct name and it makes sense to have a, you know, a second act as a, as an umpire. So I'll, I'll have to look into it, but uh, thanks for the, the buddy Blattner. I did not know he was such a big announcer. I love that. I noticed another player on that roster of the fifties gentleman named Harry Bright, who has a rather sad place in world series history. He was the 15th strikeout victim of Sandy Koufax in game one of the 63 series. Wow. I, I'm a shit. I'll never, I'll never forget what he was quoted as saying afterwards. I wait 17 years to get into a world series and I strike out. And even worse is that 55,000 people are in the ballpark hoping I would strike out. <laughs> well, especially being a big Dodgers guy, I'm disappointed I didn't know he was with the 63 Yankees and oh. was a victim because I know that Harry Bright. He uh, pinched later, it in the ninth inning. He pinched it yeah. in the ninth? Okay. Because yeah. I know that he managed this, uh, the 1975 Solons, you know, the later iteration. He right. was their manager that year. So I knew he had a second act in Sacramento, but I did not know he was a 63 Yankee. Thank you for telling me. He was a 27th out. Go, come again? He was a 27th out of the game. Wow. Now, now I and know. The 15, and the record-setting 15th strikeout. Gosh. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Hmm? Marshall, uh, so Lefty O'Doul, the manager of the San Francisco Seals in San Diego, and I think Seattle at one point, any good stories or impact on uh, the Seattle, uh, Sacramento Solons? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I want to, I still need to watch your movie about Lefty O'Doul, and I just know that he's such an influential ambassador for California baseball in so many ways. Uh, my research didn't find anything, but it is worth noting. And I'm, I'm glad you've all, this is perfect with all the prompts you've given me. I actually do plan on doing a second edition of this book uh, down the line after I finish my 1985 World Series book, which I'm about to sign the contract for. So I will keep all this in mind, including I would love to name drop Lefty O'Doul. If he had any impact on Sacramento, I'd like to find out. So, And just to follow up, I, what, you, what I made was a trailer for the film to be made about Lefty. Oh. Which, which got um, Scotch. It's been parked because of COVID. Oh. And, uh, but we'll be uh, readdressing that in the coming year and putting out an Indiegogo uh, crowdsourcing thing for funding. But uh, yes, uh, thanks for mentioning it. And I hope everybody get a chance to take a look at that. You bet. I'll, I'll definitely back it. Thanks, John. Thank you. Marshall, as you know, Sacramento has the uh, Sacramento Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame um, through Christian Brothers High School and, and uh, that foundation. Um, and there's a number of players that, that uh, attended uh, Rancho Cordova High School that, that uh, played in the majors, Niles Diamond, 
um, and amongst others. Um, and of course, the Sax brothers being the Sac from Sacramento. Yep. <clears throat> I was wondering if your book, and I'm, I'm going to order a copy of it and uh, ask you to uh, personalize it at our next uh, Dusty Baker meeting where we can meet in person. Um, but uh, does your book go into um, the stories about the, the teams other than the Solons and, and uh, the professional teams that played in, in Sacramento? Because the, it's such a, a bevy of talent that, that uh, uh, comes out of the Sacramento region. It really is. So for narrative purposes, I only focused on the professional teams like Senators, Solons, Rivercats. I did not mean to neglect other teams and high school teams. It was just that the narrative sweep, you know, it starts in the mid 19th century and goes all the way to the present day. So I had to kind of focus on that. However, in the 50 players uh, section, and I mentioned their high schools and, and whatnot, or if they went to, they played in winter league. So a lot of Christian brothers guys are accounted for. Uh, you mentioned Rancho Cordova, uh, Jeff Jenkins, you know, the yes. Milwaukee yeah. Brewers slugger, yeah. 2008 yeah. Phillies world series hero. He, he's here too. So I do mention a lot of people's uh, high schools and colleges in their respective profiles. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I could have done justice to like the schools and, you know, semi-pro stuff, but uh, other Sacramento books cover that. So, well, I think between you, Ellen O'Connor, and Bill McPhail, it's pretty well covered. I think so too. Yeah. Thank you. Rich history. Marshall, thank you very much. This was uh, this was very entertaining. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, yep. Glad uh, to be here. So yeah, thank you. Good job. Your book. Your book is in my Amazon cart now. Wonderful. <laughs> God dare it. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Marshall. Okay, good. So for the uh, second part of our uh, meeting, uh, we have Bill Nolan uh, with uh, Bob Timmerman and uh, Jeff Coleman. Bill is uh, a recipient of the Bob Davids Award. Uh, he's also the one of the co-founders of Rounder Records, uh, which means a lot to people who like folk music. Oh, Not to well. mention George Thorogood. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And uh, Bill, I'll let you go ahead and uh, introduce your topic here. Sure. Happy to. Uh, it's the first time I've been to a Los Angeles chapter meeting. I been to the San Diego chapter meeting a couple times in person, but but never got to an Alan Roth chapter meeting yet. Uh, someday, hopefully, I'll uh, get there in person. Uh, the purpose of Sabre's publishing program is to offer writing opportunities for as many Sabre members as possible. And what I'm here to talk about with Jeff and with Bob is the book, uh, one of our most recent books called Baseball's Biggest Blowout Games. Uh, we succeeded in bringing together 77 Sabre members to put this book together between the editors and the authors. I think we set a record for a Sabre book uh, in that regard. Usually there's 25, 30, maybe 40 authors, but 77 different people contributed that, this book. It's mostly a book of games written up and part of the goal of the books has been to encourage writing for a bio project, as in the case of the team books, like the 1995 Braves book that came out earlier. And uh, this book uh, was to help promote games for games project. So we got a, an, an awful lot of games that way. Uh, there are 126 games in the book. Uh, so that was a nice boost. Uh, what I did was decided to select four games for each team of the 30 current major league franchises. Uh, and that made 120 games. And then I decided to put in a few postseason games because that seemed like a good idea too. And also because the Red Sox won two of the postseason games that we put in and I happen to be a Red Sox fan. Uh, so- Here, here. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, that's reflected on the cover of the book, which I will show you. There you see Fenway Park. There you <laughs> see the score was 29 to four. 
when the uh, Red Sox beat the St. Louis Browns back in 1950. And it was, uh, it was my pleasure to take the cover photograph, not in 1950, but earlier this year. The Red Sox let me in. The park was closed, of course, all year to, uh, to fans, but they let me in back in, I think it was March, um, to, and set up the scoreboard with the, uh, the original score. It's the same scoreboard that was existed back in 1950. So uh, that was authentic. And we just depicted the way the, the scoreboard looked at the end of the game. Uh, just, this was a blowout game. Look at, I don't know if you can see those scores here, but uh, I mean, the Red Sox, I can, I got to read upside down and backwards. Nobody scored in the first inning. In the second inning, the Red Sox scored eight runs. In the third inning, the Red Sox scored five runs. In the fourth inning, they scored seven runs. If they had the chance to bat in the bottom of the ninth, which would have been a pointless pursuit, of course, uh, they would have probably passed 30 runs. They were playing the Browns. Wasn't that doing it the easy way? <laughs> well, yeah. You know, the funny thing is the day before they had won 20 to four. So here back to See what back, I mean? 20 to four. And then they upped the ante by going 29 to four. And Two days of batting was, practice. They lost a few games in a row after that. I think they ran out or something. But the, the story was, here was to tell for each franchise the, the biggest uh, blowout games. Those are not necessarily satisfying games depending on your attitude towards baseball. If you're the purist that likes a one to nothing game or say a three to two game resolved in the 13th inning, that's one thing. If you were a St. Louis Browns fan that happened to be at Fenway Park, you probably wouldn't have enjoyed this game very much or the one that preceded it. But if you're a Red Sox fan, you might have uh, really enjoyed it if you like seeing one team completely dominate the other. There was a team, there was a game uh, just not that long ago uh, in 2003 when the Red Sox uh, played the hosted the Marlins when the uh, June 27th, 2003, another ball game. It didn't make the book because the Red Sox only won by 17 runs. And that wasn't enough. That wasn't good enough to make the, make the book. They beat the Marlins 25 to eight. They got off to a really good start scoring 14 runs in the first inning. Uh. 10 runs before they even made the first out. And Johnny Damon had a double, a single, and a triple. He was three quarters of the way to a cycle in the first inning before uh, he didn't get his fourth time up. But what we did is we uh, tried to figure out uh, the, the top four blowouts for each team. Sometimes they were decided by run differential. That's why I said the Red Sox winning by 17 runs, even though it was an interesting game. The Marlins did become world champions that very same year. They lost that disastrous game. The, uh, but it was, it was determined by run differential, how many runs between the winning team score and the losing team score. And to determine that, I, I was not going to go through and try to figure it out myself, so I asked RetroSheet. Uh, Tom Ruane has all these games in a massive database and he didn't take him along at all. He ran off a, a ranked order list of the top two or 300, maybe maybe it was top four or 500 games by, um, by run differential. And then I went through and I picked out the top four for each franchise. And those are the ones that we decided to, to write up. There were some ties. There were a couple situations where they say the uh, well, one team might have won 19 to two, and then another time they won 18 to one. So they were both 17 run differential games. And I just decided between the two of them, one way or another. Typically I picked the game that was the most recent. Sometimes if a game was on the road, as opposed to at home, and there was some reason I might've picked that game. And there were, there were sort of some subjective elements that, that came in there. Most of the time, though, to, to make the final choices, I talked to the team captains. And that brings up Jeff and, and Bob here, who are each going to talk about their sections of the book. What we got is 30 different people. I should, I should call them managers, probably, because captain isn't the same thing as a baseball. Well, they, they weren't the managers. They were captains. The managers are designated by the ownership. The uh, uh, To look at the... Uh, to make the final selections and then to oversee uh, the writing of a year in review type and type of essay, but oriented towards blowout games. So Jeff uh, volunteered to write and, and did write the uh, a section on the, the 
biggest blowout games in California Angels history. And Barb wrote the section on the biggest blowout games in Los Angeles Dodgers history. And they may each, I don't recall, may each have had a choice to make in there. They wrote some of the games themselves. In fact, I think uh, Bob even wrote one of the Angels games, uh, as well as uh, chairing the, uh, the Dodgers section. Uh, but they, they can talk about their approach. I did the Red Sox section because I am a Red Sox fan and uh, I enjoyed doing that section. But, um, it was a, a very interesting process. I had a chance to involve an awful lot of people. Uh, came up with some unusual situations uh, where there, there were a few of these games that despite the massive number of runs scored, there were no home runs hit in the game. There, there were quite a few of them. Uh, there were... Uh, it, as I said, it was a very different experience for home as a way, as you can imagine, if you were uh, seeing your team get crushed, that wouldn't have been the best experience. Uh, we can't, came up with a couple of oddities after the book was mostly done. I was doing something else, research for another book and came across a situation in the Negro Leagues in 1946 where the Asheville Blues played a double header on June 9th 1946 against the Montgomery Dodgers. Uh, Asheville won the first game 24 to nothing. They won the second game 22 to nothing. Now that was a, <laughs> I imagine that was a say it was better to be at Asheville rather than a, a partisan of the, the Montgomery Dodgers. 46 to nothing in one, one day. There were a couple situations where there were games played on the same day, uh, as it happens among the 120 regular season games. Turns out there were eight of them just from the year 2018. I mean, that's it doesn't make any sense from a uh, statistical standpoint, but that's just the way it, it worked out. There were a couple this year that would have made the book. Uh, but on May 20th, 1994, Seattle beat the Texas Rangers at home uh, for the Seattle Mariners, 19 to two. And on the very same day, the Twins at home beat the Red Sox 21 to two. But it was just by pure coincidence that two of the biggest blowout games for the Mariners, well, one of the biggest blowout games for the Mariners and one for the Twins happened on the very same day. And in the book, there were two other games that also took place on May 20th. In 1996, the Braves beat the Cubs in Atlanta 18 to one, and the Diamondbacks beat the Braves 10 years later on May 20th, 2006. 13 to nothing at Chase Field. So every one of those four were hap happened to be home wins, but that wasn't always the case. Somebody did ask once if it, because uh, I've done a few of these uh, Zoom sessions, uh, asked if there were more games in say September that were blowout games, maybe because teams that were out of the pennant race had brought up some of their other people just to give them a look and they weren't at, uh, they. They just weren't trying as hard. That didn't, didn't seem to be the case. There were 20 of these games happened in April, 14 in May, 20 in June, 23 in July, 18 in August, and 21 in September. And then five from uh, early October before we get into the postseason uh, post games. Let me um, just end there and invite uh, Jeff first to talk about how he sort of the, it, basically the, the Angels history of blowout games and maybe what he learned in doing it and some of the games that he wrote up or oversaw that other folks wrote up. And then uh, Jeff could turn it over to Bob and anybody can ask questions in the chat or as a relatively small group, we could just talk here afterwards and try to answer your questions. So Jeff, well, if you're I'm, ready. I'm, I'm ready. For. Really for, for me, first of all, it was a memory refresher because I had watched those games on television. I didn't get to go to Edison Field, as it was called at the time, for the White Sox game, but I'd seen those games on television. And when you're watching blowouts like that live, it's like it's almost the most unheard of thing you ever heard of, even if you've seen it before. Because at that time, you know, I'm raising a young son in Southern California, and we're, we both became Angel fans. The first game I ever took him to was an Angel game in 2000 at night, and they beat Mariano Rivera in the 10th inning. But in 2002, with these two games, these blowouts, it was a memory refresher. I wanted to, it was good to go back, look at the play by plays, 
that retro sheet and baseball reference have and realize I wasn't just seeing things. <laughs> it happened, particularly Jeff Devanin, whose career didn't quite pan out the way people hoped, coming in late as a pinch hitter and driving in four runs in the game against the Indians. And I noticed, too, that not only the players that you'll remember best from the 2002 Angels, they were a World Series winner, but the little knowns and the unknowns had as much of a hand in these two games as the team stars like Darren Erstad and Troy Gloss and David Eckstein and Tim Salmon and Garrett Anderson. So they really were team efforts up and down the lineup. I noticed that in the Cleveland game, only one, only two Angels didn't have hits. And that's because Tim Salmon reached base otherwise and got hit by a pitch, and then his pin, he was pinch run for. And I think Orlando Palmero didn't get to hit in that game, but I don't think it mattered by then. And it was a fun season for the Angels. They were really playing a mixture of small and power ball, very well balanced. They, they had the pests who would extort their way on base. They had big boppers. They had great defenders that year. Any time you looked at an Angel game, something was liable to happen in every inning. And that was one of the fun things about that team. Up and down, they were as balanced as the day was long. And for them to have two blowouts like this, even with a balanced team like that, was remarkable. I still don't know which one was the better blowout because they both were 19-run margins, but the White Sox game was a 19 nothing shutout. But that was a fun team that year. And it was a fun atmosphere when you went to the ballpark. I got to the ballpark before, not long before the Cleveland game on the road, and I got my first taste of the Thundersticks. I went more deaf from that than I ever got seeing the Who in concert in the old days. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. And I grew up as a Met fan. And I had seen all kinds of fan racket, even when the Mets were the, the dregs of the National League. But this was something surreal. The only time the noise didn't come out was when X time was batting and they would all form the Thundersticks into the X's quietly while he was at the plate. And I noticed too, while I was doing the back research on it, that blowouts are defined differently by different people. I noticed that baseball reference, when they give you a particular team season and they give you their record on blowout games, they define blowouts as more than a five run margin and others define it as just a nine run margin but everybody's blowout seems to be different depending on how they look at it. I was really surprised at that because to me, a blowout is like, you know, nine runs, 10 run margin, 11 runs, keep, keep on going, but five runs that's, that seemed to me a bit, a little bit odd, but overall it was a great experience being part of this book. It gave me bragging rights in my family because I'm the first one in the family to be part of a book like this. And I really got a kick out of Bill asking me to write the introduction to that section. Yeah, it was a brief introduction, but it meant something to me personally because being going back and being part of these games again was a highlight for me this year. You know, I, I counted, I looked at the names of folks that are here and I counted seven different people that I see on the list as people that have contributed to one or another of Sabre's books that I'm aware of. I'm sure that a couple of you have contributed to ones that I, I just don't recall, but that's- Well, my previous contribution was something to the Black Sox Scandal <laughs> Committee newsletter about almost two years ago about the 1919 Reds. That was my previous big contribution. Good. So maybe, and, maybe, and Bob wrote the piece about the Angels and the Blue Jays to start that section. Bob, why don't you take it from here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was asked to fill in one game, and uh, I picked that one because I actually recalled um, listening to that game with my brother on the Saturday afternoon while we were out doing yard work. Um, um, that was... Uh, I believe uh, it was 1979 with up in that uh, Al Whisk doing play-by-play uh, -play for the Angels that year. Or, anyway, um, 
but it was just you know also the 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 counts of the Toronto Blue Jays who were in their third year, but they were still kind of a uh, still kind of like a, a novelty to think of the concept of oh there's there's a team called the Toronto Blue Jays, um, and uh, the Angels were you know also had not been in my lifetime been a contending team, and all of a sudden they were in first place, and and they just we never really experienced a game where a team just dismantled the opponent so quickly. I mean, the Angels scored eight and eight in the first, and they went eight, three, two, three, one, five. Uh, took the seventh inning off and then uh, added two more in the eighth. And it was really one of the first games I also remember where a position player uh, came in to pitch. The Blue Jays put in the Craig Cusick for the last three and two thirds innings. Oh. And it was, um, you know, we thought that was a novelty as opposed to, whereas today that's, you know, not that uncommon. Um, so, uh, uh, when I look back at it, I think the thing that really uh, strikes me the most is that even uh, the, uh, the the first two angels reached on an error and a I mean a walk and an error. And then the third bat, the number three hitter, Dan Ford, uh, reached on an error on a sacrifice attempt. So for some reason, Jim Fergusi thought it was best to have Dan Ford bunt over two runners for the league's best player, Don Baylor, coming up next to drive in the runs because apparently he Don Baylor would have no other way to score runners from on base unless they, he had done that um, and it turns out that Baylor just hit a grand slam instead of a perhaps a, a three run homer so and it just kept going and going it was just like we just kept wondering what it would ever end <laughs> and even though the game only took two hours and 40 minutes too so which is even uh, <laughs> when you think about that today the, the the blue jays actually went through all of four pitchers to give up uh 24 runs and, yeah the uh, indians had to use six when the angels blew them out in 2002 including cc sabathia who started the game yeah the uh i bet sabathia's fans forget that one yeah <laughs> yeah And, it, and for me, it's always the for me it was the next day because the next day the Angels were going for a sweep. They had Nolan Ryan starting against the immortal Butch Edge of the Blue Jays, and of course, oh, there's one of the great names in baseball. The Blue Jays won the game. <laughs> the Blue Jays won the next day. So, um, because you know, that's the way the sport goes. <laughs> the Blue in Jays those actually, years, that's the way the Angels win. Yeah. Blue Jays actually won nine to three that day. So, um, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, that's one thing different about Major League Baseball. You don't see twenty-four to two scores in Little League. Yeah, <laughs> the mercy rule. Oh, yeah. You might in high school once in a while. But most high schools have a mercy. Yeah, high schools have a mercy rule, though. Yeah, it should. I mean, for. I guess you could get to 24 if you started up really early or hit it at the right inning or something like that. You know, when I went back to review those games for this book, one thing that really struck me was that even going into the top of the eighth in the Cleveland game, the score was only nine to one. And theoretically the Indians could have come back, but then the angels drop a 10 spot on them in the eighth inning. Mm -hmm. Also they had, there were two innings in that game where the angels were shut out and in the white Sox game a little over a week later, they were scoreless in three of the innings. They, and that game, I think they had, they had an eight run third and then three runs in the fifth, sixth and seventh and two in the fourth is how they piled it up. And speaking of blowouts at the high school level, I think you'd be much more likely to see, a 23 to 22 score in a college game than a high school game because high school games you often get very unevenly matched teams even within a league or a division but i do believe i used to umpire a lot of 23 to 22 games (laughs) baruch baruch against john jay 
yeah. Where were you when the Phillies and the Cubs played to 23-22 <laughs> in Wrigley Field that day? <laughs> the Kingman Schmidt show. Yeah, I, I would. They I get would a like, little tedious. <laughs> I I would like to mention. Uh, uh, I'm an Angel fan, and I seem to remember, this is all memory, and maybe it's wrong, but one time they scored like nine runs in the first inning, or maybe it was 13 runs in the first inning, and they lost the game. So are, have, have there been any recorded like that? That wouldn't have been the subject of this book, of course. The, uh, there is another book that will come out. It's one of the next books coming out on called Baseball. Well, I don't remember what it's called, but basically the greatest comeback games. Hmm. And that one will have some very close yeah. scores. That'll be out sometime this month or next, I think. So I have a question for all three of you, if any of you knows. Did you, were you able to figure out which team among the, the current teams or the teams that used to be, it has the mo been the most frequently blown out team by the uh, metrics that you're using for your book? You'd think I would have calculated that and put it in the book, but I didn't. Okay. I don't, I don't think it crossed anybody's mind at the time we were putting it together. It's but it would have been great. Have a thing for losers, I guess. It would have been. Know. Oh, it would have been a great event. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's funny yeah. you mentioned the thing for losers. I grew up as a Mets fan since the day they were born. I saw my first major league game in the Polo Grounds when the Mets played there, waiting for Shea Stadium. Wow. And the first, but the first blowout that I can remember seeing, and it's in the book, the nineteen to one beating the Mets dropped on the Cubs in nineteen sixty four. Bill they Howie. televised that game back to back to New York, and it was remarkable. Oh, they did so, it at so, Wrigley, not oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, Lindsay Nelson, Bob Murphy, and Ralph Kiner were calling the game on the road, and they <laughs> televised it back to New York. And if you were a Met fan in those years, you would tell them, you would say this. Somebody asked you the score of the Mets game. You say nineteen to one. They'd say, "Are you were they ahead or behind?" <laughs> You're right, <laughs> but. And the anomalous thing to me, and I still remember it well, the Cubs started a right-handed pitcher named Bob Buell, and Casey Stingle loaded his lineup with right-handed hitters. Hmm. He had a hunch. Well, he saw things that others didn't see on particular mm -hmm. days. In some ways, Stingle was kind of the founding father of analytics because he thought analytically going back to when he managed the Yankees, right. he built his, team, he built his teams that way. He made his moves that way. The purists scream bloody murder when he brings in a right-handed pitcher to face a right-handed hitter in a world series game. And the guy gets him out. He saw what nobody else saw except maybe branch Ricky. But for me, it was fascinating reading the rest of the book, too, and seeing all these games, a lot of which I remembered seeing, like the Mets game I just talked about, some of which I hadn't gotten to see but had heard about. And now reading it by all these writers here, I really got more perspectives on those games than I had going in. Well, maybe we could move to the Dodgers games. And, and Bob, you could tell us about that section. Sure. Um, well, obviously, the Dodgers, we got – much larger universe of games to, to, to pick from. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we, we threw out some uh, 19th century games, usually because it'd be harder to get documentation uh, from, but in 1886, Brooklyn did win uh, uh, 25 to one over Baltimore, which uh, is their uh, still their high water mark. Um, but uh, they do, they do not have a, a 20 plus, victory in uh in since since the 19th century they have uh and so we have their two 19 run victories uh one in 1901 uh with brooklyn beating cincinnati uh then the one i wrote which came in 1969 against the padres at 19 0 <coughs> shutout and uh and then in the, uh, 2002, we added the game, which was Dodgers came very close to matching the 19-0 shutout, but uh, Arizona was able to get one run and hmm. uh, make it uh, 19 to a, a, a 19 to one game. So, um, 
um, I, I I wrote up the the 1969 game. Um, I'm I was too young to to remember that. I was just three at the time. I mean, I have older brothers who who had spoken about it, so I was I was quite interested in it, and uh, it was. Uh, Mostly because one of the things it was, it was Don Drysdale's last victory, and he pitched a complete game shutout, and then eventually had a couple more starts, and then his arm just just gave out. Um, and when I looked at it, I, I was just amazed at also just how incredibly bad the Padres starting lineup was that game. Their their best player that season was Nate Colbert, and he. Uh, Colbert was out with uh, for military duty, and so they were just bringing up, just throwing out anyone they could. Um, one thing that also complicated things is the Padres in their first year did not have a Triple A franchise, so they were bringing up players from Double A or they, they had a Triple A agreement. They they shared a Triple A team with the with the Pirates, but they didn't have a Triple A AAA team of their own yet. Um, and uh, when you look, I'm looking at the baseball reference uh, box score. And these were the, uh, I believe the batting averages at the end of the day for the uh, Padres uh, starters that day. I'll read off who it goes. 191, 143, 255, 255, 239, 155, 219, 155. Uh, and with the uh, starting pitcher, Steve Arlen uh, at zero. And that was uh, Arlen's second game of the year, his first start of the season and he had not gone to spring training because he had uh, insisted that he wanted to go to uh, dental school uh, the off season and uh, he was insistent on that and, and 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 he did end up becoming a dentist um, and apparently Jim Lonborg to... call your office yeah <laughs> yeah so the, uh, the 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 and despite their their lack of uh, you know, personnel there. Uh, Preston Gomez did not use any position players to pitch in the game. He just tossed, trotted out five pitchers, pretty much most of them worse than the last one. Um, but uh, Steve Erlin, Tommy Sisk, Gary Ross, Jack Balchin, and Billy McCool, who did throw a shutout inning, um, which, uh, which was granted was the ninth inning. And by that time, it was out of it. I mean, there were, there were many things that just, didn't make sense. I think the the game was kind of summed up when uh, uh, when uh, Gary Ross was relieving, and at one point the Dodgers were up uh, fourteen to nothing in the fifth, and Wes Parker was on second base, and Ross decided I'm going to pick Parker off second and threw the ball into center field. Uh, allowing Parker to score and just trying to think of, you know, the mindset of saying, you know, this is a good time to run the daylight play when we're up 14 to nothing here. Cause maybe he'll be, maybe Parker will be leaning or something like that. Um, so, um, and then the other thing that caught me in the game was that uh, Don Drysdale um, in the number nine hole batted five times, which is, uh, not something off that uh, that uh, National League pitchers uh, um, do, and well, depending on the fate of the DH, it's not, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, okay. the, uh, uh, no Dodger pitcher done it again. I think it's happened. To, excuse me, uh, Drysdale batted five times. He had six plate appearances in the in the game in the in the ninth slot. So. Um, um, I believe a couple, I think one or two other pitchers have, have, have done that since 1969. Uh, but usually because most, you know, who's going to leave your pitcher in for that many innings when you're up by such a wide margin anyway. So, um, and even Drysdale had a double in the game. So the Dodgers only had one home run too. They had uh, 19 runs on 17 hits. And uh, and uh, twelve walks, which uh, were I'm sure were were fun to watch. And the Padres threw four wild pitches, and committed three errors. <laughs> but and they made a pass ball. But you know, other than that, 
they had a good offense. No. So the, the 69 Padres, yes, they, they did have their issues, but as I pointed out uh, also in my game piece, in, in September during the, the very topsy-turvy 1969 NL West race, which is often ignored in baseball history because of the because the 1969 is basically you know the National League story is basically just the Mets and the Cubs. Um, for, for every team in the NL West was, was pretty much in contention that year with the exception of the Padres and the Dodgers were going into San Diego towards the end of the year. Uh, you know, nearing in on first in first place and they went into San Diego and they got swept in a four game series by the Padres. Uh, they scored like three or four runs in the whole series and that ended the Dodgers chances of uh, catching the uh, uh, catching Atlanta that year. I'm glad you reminded me about that series because my usual memory of the 1969 Padres is Nate Colbert and the cast of several. Yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, it was a, it, it was a long year. So, uh, <laughs> most expansion years, the first year, they are long years for those teams. Yeah, the 1962 Mets are the classic example. Only they were funny about it. Yeah, the best way to describe them was they had who the hell's on first, what the hell's on second. You don't want to know who's on third. And you don't even want to think about it's on shortstop. <laughs> Also, the, the Padres also had the disadvantage of, of, of being an expansion team, and they're playing in, at that point, to San Diego Stadium, which was massive with huge walls, and it was extremely hard to hit home runs. Uh, so they were playing in a playing in a pitcher's park. Um, and, you know, it's never been a stadium. That, that that's, location was never a huge, you know, big draw and it's been finally been torn down i mean uh, uh it's always sad over, when you have a pitcher's park but you don't have the pitchers pitchers yeah <laughs> well it eventually worked out for him in in 1984 but um you know uh, colbert managed 24 home runs and ollie brown hit 20 um but uh, that was few and far between um oh god i forgot about downtown ollie brown so the team was uh Last in runs, and uh, they, they actually were 10th in home runs, but I'm pretty sure that's because uh, the Astrid home was, was even worse. Um, so, um, last in batting average on base percentage, slugging, need to say OPS, you know. So, um, yeah. And uh, pitching staff, you know, not too bad, at least, you know, the starters, you know, I mean, they all took a lot of losses just because the offense was so bad, but the pitching staff, you know, for an expansion team, you know, it was 4.24. It was second to last in the, in the, in the, in the league, but it's still, I would consider respectable for just grabbing whomever was available at the time. So, because the 1969 Dodgers offense was not exactly a formidable group, you know, it was kind of a, hodgepodge put together for for that for that season and it it the Dodgers kind of even overachieved to, to kind of be in competition that year a uh, question about the book <clears throat> were there any pitchers who were victimized more than once don't recall Bill did you ever account for how many uh, players went for the cycle in these games, hit for the cycle. There's no, don't know that one either. It seems like um, quite a few things we could have followed up on here. Okay. I, I seem to recall uh, Chris Spire being one of them, at least. Um, and he was like 38 years old when he did it hmm. uh, in one of the Giants blowout games. Um, how about uh, pitchers hitting home runs uh, in the blowout games? Were there any memorable uh, multiple home runs by pitchers? I don't, I don't know. Either of you know, you other guys, Jeff or Bob? 
Well, I was covering the, an American League team, so the pitchers yeah. weren't hitting. Right. Yeah. Depending on the era. Yeah, the one I was, and I, I thought, you know, maybe Drysdale did one, but he, he was only a, he had, you know, he, he had like a double and a walk in the game. So um, the, uh, the, the Chris Fire uh, cycle game is covered uh, July 9th, 1988 right. by Bruce Enos. Mm-hmm. Uh, Giants 21, Cardinals 2 at Candlestick Park. Yes. So. And the amazing thing about that, Spire was 38 years old. And to, to get that triple was a major accomplishment. I think it was more amazing that Chris Spire had for, had for the cycle twice. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. Um, so for each, each franchise, you have four games. Are some of the, for example, like the, the 19 to 0. Dodger Padre game that Bob referred to. Is that also on the Padres, one of the Padres four games? No, it, it's four games won by each team. Oh, okay. So, uh, I mean, it's it's interesting that of the um, the four Los Angeles Dodgers blowouts games, not one of them actually took place in Los Angeles. They were in Cincinnati, San Diego, Philadelphia, and Phoenix. Hmm. Just unfortunate for the hometown fans. The Padres uh, games, that is, uh, they beat the Marlins, the Astros, the Mets, and the Braves. Three of the four were at a San Diego ballpark. The one against the Astros was at the Astrodome. But yeah, we, did, we, uh, we wanted to have four. And I, one thing I also didn't do is go through and just look at the losers of the selected games to see just out of this particular selection, if there was one team that lost significantly more than anybody else. It doesn't really mean anything, but it's just one of those things that would have, would have been good to put together. Of the blowouts, how many, uh, how many instances did you see position players uh, having to pitch at the end of the game? Don't recall very many of them, actually. Uh, that's uh, I, I always enjoy that when that happens. I w- w- wrote a whole thing about position pitchers pitching for the Red Sox at one point, just to just to look at that. I, I, you know, at least a few Hall of Famers, Ted Williams, Jimmy Fox, both pitched in Red Sox games. In the in the Angels Blue Jays game with with Craig Cusick pitching at the end, the the I brought up because I found this in the. Uh, friends of mine in Canada sent me the Toronto Star edition of it. Uh, the uh, the the Blue Jays had had gotten into a dispute with the Orioles because they had used two position players in a game with um, uh, Earl Weaver put two in, not because it was much as a bluff because it was a protest over field conditions. So we had Elrod Hedricks and I believe Larry Harlow pitch. And in Peter Bavese, the Blue Jays was took great umbrage to this, and then, and then a few months later, his manager uh, has to go put a a, a, a uh, position player in. And, and after the game, he he admitted that 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 he had to that 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 he was wrong the first time, and he had to own he had to own his mistake, which I thought was. Pretty, you know, humbling after you know your team just Bye-bye. loses twenty-four to two. <laughs> yeah. Would seventeen to three qualify as a blowout game? It would. It might, it probably wouldn't make this book unless it was the Diamondbacks who had the got well, a couple couple I, wins. Do you remember what team it was? Yeah, the Giants and the Braves. Tony Clollinger. Yeah, two grand yeah. slams that game. Right. That was a, that was uh I mean the Giants games, they they've been around for a long time too, being the New York Giants before. So we had a, more than an entire century of games for them. There was uh they beat the Braves 20 Boston Braves 22 to 1. The Cardinals 21 to 2 in 1988. 
beat the New York Giants, beat the Philadelphia Phillies uh, in 1931, 23 to five and 18 to nothing. The 2000 Giants beat the Expos in San Francisco. Was yeah. this one of the games? This, this would have been, been, a, this would have been a, a Braves game because the Braves won 17 to three. Right. I remember I, I listened to the game. Oh. Yeah, two grand slams by a pitcher is pretty amazing. Yeah, in one game. Oh. Yeah, you're talking about pitchers hitting in the blowout games, and one of the parts of the book that I really loved was the anecdote about Whitey Ford when the Yankees blew the Senators out, going four for five in that game. And I loved the writer bringing back up Casey Stengel's postmortem. I think I have it right in front of me. In fact, he said. You will recollect that he gets four hits and five tries. He gets four hits and five tries the previous week. He gets becomes hit crazy on. At that point, he's a little hard to handle. <laughs> and Whitey, Whitey Ford was good handling a bat anomalously. I mean, you know, most pitchers don't, but he did very well in those in those years. I think that he also went four for five against the Browns in the <laughs> same time frame. And they weren't big hits; they were they were singles. And one of the one of them was when he ignored a bunt sign. A couple of, I had got an idea for a future book from what some of the things people have been saying here. Probably couldn't be in Saber, but it's sort of essentially a book of the most unusual games, like Clevenger hitting two grand slams in a game, or the twenty three to twenty two game that somebody mentioned earlier. Um, one of the goals of Saber book. Oh, there is a book about that game. The Phillies and the Cubs. Yeah, well, a whole book, but I'm, I'm talking about a book that embraces a lot of different games. Most of them have probably already been written for games projects, so it wouldn't be a book that Sabre would put together probably, but um, could draw on Sabre because we try to encourage new writing, not just repackage stuff that's already been written. I, I would like to ask, uh, what was the percentage of the games that were at home and that were on the road. And also, if we have a definition of what a blowout game is, I don't know how many runs you would take for that, how frequently they occur. Well, somebody mentioned before how there are different definitions for what a blowout game is. So you know, one would have to agree on a definition. But what about the home versus uh, away blowout games for this book? For this book, I, I don't know. Thank you. I, I think I can tell you about the Angels. Oh, we're it looks to it looks to me like the Angels covered one. It was one game at home and three on the road that year. The White Sox blowout they that the Angels won was at Anaheim. The Indians game and. The game against the Red Sox, they they were played on the road for the Angels, and I think the Blue Jays wasn't that. Yeah, that that was in Toronto too. So it was one home game and three road games for the Angels in that section. Was that blowout game against the Red Sox when Freddie Patek hit his uh, home runs? I'm looking now. I think it was. Let's see. I'm, There's a question yeah, in the, the chat. Yeah, chat I've got the book in front of me. The largest shutout game here, and I'm I'm trying to go through. It's a lot of twenty to one games, but. Oh no! What no? The the Freddie Patek. I don't know. I'm looking at that game right now, so I'll tell you in a second. Nineteen to nothing had been the record for a while, but it there was a nineteen has, to there's nothing been, there's exposed been, against the uh, the Braves in nineteen seventy eight. Yeah, I think someone's there's been a I think there's been a twenty plus run shutout win in recent years. The, the the most runs scored was the thirty to three game that happened just well it was a few years ago, two thousand seven, Rangers over the Orioles. At Baltimore. So if you're at Oriole, at, at Camden Yards, 
that day and you were an Orioles fan, 30 to three, your team lost. <laughs> How many fans were left by the ninth inning? I heard that a few of them went to file human rights violations charges at the Hague <laughs> after that game. Yeah. Okay, and in the Angels blowout on the Blue Jays, Freddie Patek wasn't a factor in that game. Don Baylor hit a home run. I done in about what? Say hi to Lewis. Hold on. Is that? I don't see any larger shutout games, but it's it's the table of contents is not put together in a helpful design. Anybody that among you all here that has not yet contributed to a Sabre book, think about it. It's it's fun to write up one of these games, uh, it, especially if it's a more recent game, you'll be able to watch the game again on YouTube. That was not something you could do when you're writing up a Brooklyn Dodgers 1901 game, but you could write up a Los Angeles Dodgers 2016 game and, and just watch the entire game, look at news coverage, pretty readily accessible online for the home and away newspapers. And uh, I don't know, it, I can write up a game in about three or four hours, usually, if I uh, just sit down and block out everything else. And I don't usually watch the entire game if it happens to be one that's on YouTube. But uh, if you don't find television, you'll find a lot of radio broadcasts yeah, that are up there. Yeah. As a matter of fact, back in spring, when everything shut down, I decided to treat myself and listen to the final home game of the Senators before they moved to Texas, the one that ended in the forfeit with the fan right in the ninth inning. The entire radio broadcast, including the broadcaster's sad post-mortems on the fan riot, are there. I was looking to see if I could get my Angel games on YouTube, and I couldn't get them. I couldn't even get the radio broadcast. But with a lot of games, you will find radio broadcasts if you don't find the television films. Hmm. And listening to the radio broadcast is just as fascinating. Uh, You're familiar with uh, Baseball Direct. There's a thing called the Miley Collection. Yeah. And he has a whole bunch of uh, baseball games that he had recorded. I'm making a note of that right now. M-I-L-E-Y. -M yeah. I also have some football stars. games, baseball games, uh, several items on there. It's all on Baseball Direct. But I Thanks for that information. I have it written down. I'm going to be looking, giving that a pull later. I'd encourage anybody to just just pick a random game almost and, and write it up just for fun. Uh, just reserve it with games projects so that uh, somebody else isn't working on the same game. And the first game I wrote up when we started games project, I, I thought, well, I'll just pick some random games. So the game I wrote up was the first game that I took my son to. My father had been a hot dog vendor at Fenway Park in the 1930s for a couple of years. And when I asked him what was the first game that he took me to, he couldn't remember. So I thought, well, I better memorialize this for my son uh, and not let him down the way my father let me down. Uh, so I, I mean, it's a, it was a meaningless game. Nothing of interest happened during the game in one sense. I mean, I, I can't remember who won, but uh, I, I just enjoyed writing it up because it, it was a baseball game and telling the story. And... The, the biggest, uh... Shut out when in the book is uh, Cleveland 22, Yankees 0. Oh, good. That was in August 31st, 2004. 2004 didn't turn out to be the best year for the Yankees. Uh, no, Cleveland made that late run to try to catch the White Sox and, and tried to, I mean, tried to, oh, no, no, that's right. They did win the division. That did not end well in the playoffs for them. Because the Yankees dished out a big uh, blowout uh, in game three of the ALCS. And then 
Well, Dave Roberts stole second the next day and, well, you know, the rest. <laughs> David Ortiz won both games in extra that, innings. That's right. And Bill, Dick has and anybody I were, probably, won- were both there at the 19 to 8 game, I think. Bill, has anybody written up that Senators game that I mentioned a little while ago, the final home game that ended in the fan riot? Because if nobody has, I'd like to. Look it up. I I, I don't know. I mean, I I, I can't. Oh, I thought you might know at the top of your head. At the same time. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. Well, th- I want to thank you all for inviting me to this meeting. I have to go now because I have a family thing to take care of. But thank you very much again. Let's do it again soon. Glad you yeah, Bill, uh, Bob, Jeff, thank you very much. This was entertaining. You're <laughs> welcome. I enjoyed it too. See you again soon, I hope. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, anybody uh, have anything else to add? I, I would say we were talking about radio announcers. Uh, I don't know if it was through Sabre, but uh, I remember seeing a link one time where they had Walter Johnson with a uh, uh, a co-host and they were calling uh, a game at the end of the season, I think it was 1940 and, or 39, and it was only part of a game, but it's interesting the style in those times, they would, uh, uh, they would be silent between the pitches. In other words, they, they weren't talking constantly, it just, uh, no sound at all. And there was also some other fellow who uh, used to come to the Sabre uh, annual meetings. Uh, he had, I guess it was a little business where uh, for a present that you could give to a baseball fan, he would take a game, uh, maybe a World Series game and for the person that you wanted to give the present to, he would have them come in as a relief pitcher to win the game or something like that. So those are two things about uh, uh, audio renditions of ball games. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Good to see everybody. Uh, There are going to be some uh, activities on Sabre Day at the end of January. We're having another regional uh, at the end of February. So if you have something to present, uh, something you're working on, let me know. And we'll include that in the activities of our next meeting. So have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Everyone keep Barry. Happy holidays. Hey, Marshall, see ya. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, okay, Barry. Steve. Thanks, Marshall. Thanks. Take care, Steve. Joe. Thank you, Perry. Everybody. Thank you. Take care, Jeff. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you, Bye, Barry. Dixie. See you later, bye-bye.